The classification of financial instruments in accordance with IFRS 9 is often considered a complex topic. And even after having learned the requirements of IFRS 9, accountants in practice keep scratching their heads. The purpose of this video is to try to develop an uh, intuitive understanding as to the classification requirements in accordance with IFRS 9 and how we can actually make some sense of why we are classifying a particular financial instrument in a particular way. When we recognize any asset, we expect to drive future economic benefits from it. And broadly speaking, we have to either recognize, carry that asset at fair value, at some sort of a fair value model, or at some sort of a cost model. And you may have noticed that standard setters seem to be more cautious when allowing the fair value model because there's always a risk that the fair value might not eventually be realized and so the investors might be misled. And therefore, in some cases, like inventory, the fair value option is not there. Even in those cases where fair value recognition is allowed, the standard setters are very particular as to where that fair value change should be recognized. For example, if an asset is, was purchased for $100 and it increased to $120, should that $20 increase be reflected in profit and loss or other comprehensive income? Or should it be recognized in statement of changes in equity directly without going through the profit and loss and OCI? Why all the fuss? Why does it matter where we reflect the changes in fair value of any asset? It can be useful to think of it in the following manner. When we recognize a change in profit and loss, in a way we are signaling the investors that this change has something to do with the performance of the entity. And at the other end of the spectrum, when we recognize something in a statement of change in equity, we are trying to abstract things away. We are trying to signal that this change has hardly anything to do with the performance of the entity. If all of this makes sense, we can use the same analog for understanding the IFRS 9 classification requirements. If you remember our first video, we described a financial asset as a right to receive cash or other financial instruments. It's an asset because we expect to receive future economic benefits from it. Now imagine a financial asset whose fair value is volatile in the market, it keeps changing. Now without any further information about that asset, whether that asset should be recognized at fair value or at cost model. Well, it's impossible to tell with this little information on any reasonable basis. Now, what if I tell you that that financial asset is actually a debt instrument and the entity will not sell it till maturity? Now things have changed, right? We now know that the fair value of that uh, asset will never be realized. And because it's a debt instrument, we can imagine that we would be receiving known fixed amount of payments till the asset maturity. Given those assumptions, if you recognize the change in fair value of that asset in a profit and loss, would not that add extra noise to the performance of the entity? Why should we reflect fair value changes in profit or loss when we know that we would be receiving known fixed amounts till maturity? On the other hand, if I told you that the same asset was not a debt instrument, but, a, but an equity instrument, what implication would there be if the fair value of that asset increases? Well, the fair value increase might reflect that the entity has actually performed well and is likely to earn better in the future and is likely to pay higher dividends in the future. So in case of an equity instrument, the fair value changes have the potential to increase or decrease the future cash flows. Therefore, it makes more sense to recognize the fair value changes of an equity instrument in a statement of income. But which statement? OCI or profit and loss? Before we answer that question, I want you to also consider the debt instrument example again. Although in case of a debt instrument, we expect to, expect to receive known fixed amounts in the future, but what if I told you that we, in case of this particular debt instrument, we expect to sell that instrument anytime soon? Scenario has changed, right? Because we want to sell that asset, the fair value of that asset is more likely to be realized and therefore it's more relevant to the performance of the entity and it's more deserving of being reflected in the profit or loss. If you could bear with me this far, congratulations, because all it does is just about to settle. To simplify all these seemingly complex considerations, IFRS 9 has, has actually turned them into a rule of thumb, or more appropriately, into a pair of tests. The first one being the cash flow characteristic test and the other being the business model test. The cash flow characteristic test is instrument focused. It tells us whether the cash flows of that instrument 
our known amounts that are to be received in the future as in a basic landing arrangement. It's the same thing that we have roughly referred to as that instrument in our previous examples. The result of this cash flow characteristic test is binary. It's a yes or a no. It's either SPPI or a non-SPPI. Before you yell at me, what the heck is SPPI? It just means solely payments of principal and interest. And this is the cash flow characteristic of those instruments that are SPPI. And the second test is about how the instrument is managed or the portfolio in which that instrument resides is actually managed. And this test determines how likely are we to sell a particular asset anytime soon. Let that sink in. So the business model test, as I first hand calls it, divides a portfolio into three categories. A portfolio can either be a held to collect, a held to collect and sell, or a held to sell. And as the name suggests, the held to sell business model is where we are holding securities to just earn profits by selling them. The held to collect and sell uh, is where we are holding securities to fulfill some liquidity or other requirements. And whenever we find profitable, we sell those securities. And hold to collect this model, as the name suggests, is where we hold securities to collect their contractual cash flows until the security's maturity. So it's almost unlikely that a security in the hold to collect portfolio would be sold before maturity. Of course, there are several details and nuances as to each of these tests, which deserve their own separate videos. Yet, on the basis of the overall understanding we've developed, we can proceed to claim the fruits of our labor. And let's finally connect all the dots and see how the financial instruments are classified based on these two criteria. So let's first put our instrument into the SPPI test yeah. or the cash flow characteristic test. If that financial instrument is SPPI, we have to further see where does that instrument fall on the business model test. If our financial asset is SPPI, we have to further pass it through the business model test. If that SPPI asset is held to sell, then it's classified as fair value through profit or loss. If the same SPPI is held to collect and sell, in that case, we have to classify it fair value through other comprehensive income. And if that same SPPI asset is held to collect, in that case, we have to classify it as amortized cost. On the other hand, if the asset was non-SPPI, we simply classify it as fair value to profit and loss. We do not have to further pass it through the business model test. Now, these are the main highways and the main cities. This is the rule of thumb. But there are exceptions to this rule of thumb and we'll look into those exceptions in our next video. If you would like more of these intuitive explanation videos, do let me know by clicking the like button.